Hey folks, welcome back to the Unbeatable Mind Podcast. My name is Mark Devine and I am super stoked that you're here joining me today. Thanks very much for your time and don't take it for granted. We won't waste it. In fact, we're on a tight timeline. We are here at the Spartan World Championships at Lake Tahoe and podcasting up a storm. I mean, it's been nonstop and it's been a lot of fun. I have met some incredible people, including Chris Waddell, who we're going to be talking to today. Man, Chris, what a, like he's got, I can already tell, um, and this is something I have some experience with, like it's just this massively open heart. Like he's got a heart of gold. You know, Chris is uh, paralyzed from the sure. waist down mm-hmm. uh, from a skiing accident in college. So this has been living with this for a very long time. He's a world-class athlete you know the accolades and the things i won't go through them you can read them on the show notes just extraordinary what he's accomplished and how he's overcome you know this obstacle but also be you know to be an example for for everyone not just uh people who have had similar obstacles and um chris got a great sense of humor he's just an all-around good guy and i'm really honored to uh, be able to meet you so thanks for you know thanks for your time and thanks hey for happy here. to be here thank you yeah. likewise so you know i i went to colgate university uh, right okay. up in that same neck of the woods is Middlebury, kind of in the same genre, like lower Ivy League school. And sure. Yes. I'm also a skier. Ah, okay. I raced when I was a kid, and um, I, I wasn't, our high school didn't have a race team. I was in a little public high school. There's no okay. funding for that. But then uh, I got into swimming, and I ended up swimming at Colgate. Even oh, you though did? We okay. had a ski team at Colgate. Not as quite as big as Middlebury's. Sure. But, so anyways, um, I just thought it'd be kind of cool because we have some similarity there, but that's yeah. about where it ends probably. You know, long, Our lives long went in different and, directions, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, the <laughs> swimming part I try to avoid. Right. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> yeah, swimming is interesting. Uh, did you grow up in Vermont? I grew up in Massachusetts, actually. You grew up in Massachusetts, okay. Yeah, so Western Mass, hour and a half west of Boston. Okay. So yeah. in a town called Granby Mass, just a tiny little town. Yeah, those are beautiful little towns in Massachusetts and that whole northeastern New England area. It really is. It really is. You know, the classic, just green yeah. common right. in the center of town. All the houses are just and like white. Look like yeah. it right, came, came right out of like 1790. In fact, the house I lived in upstate New York was built in 1798. Wow. It was this massive limestone structure built for Colonel Adam Mappa, who was a basically a mercenary from, okay. the, from the Dutch, you know, from Holland, okay. who came over to help the revolutionaries you know, wow. beat the Redcoats. And, and so was it solid enough that, that, that you had actually like <laughs> flat floors, you know? Well, and, the floors were amazing. It was all these intricate little wood pieces laid in with all these designs okay. throughout the whole house. I mean, it must have t- it took them years to build this house. Yeah. And it, it was pretty solid. I mean, it, it was a hard house to maintain. My parents, who are now in the 80s, they still live there. Oh, wow. And this is a house that has 12, no, eight fireplaces. 12 foot high ceilings because that's how you had to heat back then that's right and right. This, you know now it's got central heating but you know it's just cost a fortune to um to heat it's just this massive stone structure on 10 acres of land <laughs> it's really cool my point is those those towns are really historical in significance and they can, really can't this house is on the national historic register they really can't sell it they've right. tried oh like, okay. who's gonna buy this monstrosity that costs more to maintain than you know practically yeah. it's worth right Anyway, so you somebody to, has to fall in love with it. Someone has to fall and turn it into a B and B or you right. know, something like that. Oh, so cool. Middlebury, um, you went and ski. You were a skier in high school. So tell us skied a little bit about Skied in high school. So yeah, so your, I skied in high school. I skied skied USSA as well. So I skied you with you know I skied with the school, but then I skied independently as well. And then and then going to college, I'm in Middlebury Division One skiing, and mm-hmm. and I had not gone to like a ski academy. I went to Deerfield Academy, so oh, I went to I like Deerfield. a traditional sure. prep school. Right. And and we skied, you know, probably you know an hour 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 and a half a day kind of thing every day during the winter and so we got a fair amount but it was it was a significantly different amount than than the people who are who are out at ski academy so i was looking at going to going to college and trying to put my time in and try to figure out how good i actually could be and i had my aspirations for the olympics no no i was i was hoping to ski well in college i was really that was that was going to be the end of it and that's that's what's funny is that that I went in with these, trying to figure out how good I could be. I had my accident, and then I had another world that opened up to right. me, where I I wouldn't have I would have skied through college probably, but I wouldn't have I wouldn't have gone Isn't fifteen that years how afterwards. Life changes so quickly like that. It's, I mean, you would have yeah. yeah you probably ended your ski. You would have gone into investment banking or something like that, right? Sure. Which is what right, everyone exactly. from Middlebury and Colgate did, or yep. that's kind of the path I took too. And my life changed for different reasons, but um. Is there anything noteworthy about the um, 
the day of the accident, like what, now how you process that, and you know the real, the, you know the realization of the change, the sudden change. I mean, what was that like? You know, everyone's got a little bit different take on the, the a major life changing yeah. crisis like that. How it affects them and what the lessons were. The the date is it, so it was it was December twentieth of nineteen eighty eight, and in some ways it's it's like a second birthday, right? It's a, yeah, his yeah. life was one way, and then all of a sudden it's totally different. Then it's changed, and it's and it's a day. I think my birthday. I think I understand that. Actually, funny enough, now that you're asking, today is actually my birthday oh, happy as birthday. well. So thank oh, you. Goodness. Yes, exactly. So I don't know how I got into that, but but yeah, we're That's talking cool. about birthdays, so it's my birthday. But uh, but. It, it's a date that in some ways is just kind of, it's, it, it's almost a time that you don't completely understand, right? right. That these, this thing ha- happens and you think, well, you know, is, was it faded in some way? Was it, right. was it some sort of Im- imbalance within, you know, within my karma or what, you know I mean? It's right. like, you think on these kinds right. of, was this a preordained thing? Like level, were you meant yeah. to live this life and not that life? Yeah. Did it's, it happen for a reason? Right. You know, and, and I think that that's when something significant like that happens. You think, okay, did it happen for a reason? Sometimes we as human beings, I think, dig too deeply yeah, into this. Like, right. okay, well, we I want to it. find meaning and create a story around it. Right, so exactly. And we, we do live. need to create a story yeah. because we need to create a story for ourselves. The funny thing is it gave me more of an opportunity to do things that I probably wouldn't have done otherwise. I would have Pro- been... Probably wouldn't have done? Well, probably wouldn't. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't, like, have, I wouldn't have competed... I wouldn't have competed in, you know, on the highest level of right. sport. You wouldn't have cycled up Kilimanjaro. I, I wouldn't have. No, I might have climbed <laughs> Kilimanjaro. Climbed. I might have, but who knows? I mean, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have spent my life. I wouldn't have competed for through 36 years old. Right. You know, that that right. was really, I would have started a, a more traditional career. Right. And there, there are, you know, there, there are always compromises on, on those things. Mm-hmm. But, but mm-hmm. I, I was able to follow a passion for a really long time. I wouldn't have made my life as a speaker. Right. I, I wouldn't have made, I wouldn't right. have done it, you know? Right. So, so it's funny to see these things and, and to, you know, to, to meet presidents, to, to be in behind the, the velvet ropes with, with some of the leaders to have, I saw you, the Dalai Lama bestowed some nice comments on you or something like that. Did you actually, you met the Dalai Lama or I met the Dalai Lama. Um, so the, it was, it's the unsung hero of compassion award. Wow. And, and I have a, a good friend, uh, the uh, good friends, uh, Dick and Ann Grace, who, mm-hmm. who have a vineyard in, in Napa and, and they, they do a lot of work. They did a lot of philanthropic work in, in Tibet, a lot with, a lot with women and, mm-hmm. and we're helping women and young girls out and stuff like that. And they were, they were brought their wine to a fundraising event that we did in Park City with the National Ability Center. And I skied with Dick and Ann mm-hmm. and, and I think this was like second run. And Dick was, Dick, Dick was an old, old Marine oh, and, cool. and it was, it was beginning of, beginning of March and it was, it was comfortable as far as the weather was concerned concerned but he didn't he didn't wear any gloves he didn't wear a hat he had his sort of button down shirt with his v-neck sweater <laughs> and and that was it no goggles nothing and i said aren't you aren't you cold and he looked at me and said i, do, I don't get cold you know like <laughs> cold is a state of mind and i was like okay okay and uh, but he said to me he said we're going to give you this award because his group because they worked so they did so much work in tibet he worked with his holiness and, and so they every five years they would give out these awards the unsung hero of compassion awards oh, to 50 cool. people throughout the world and it was it was people who you know had grown up on like you know in, in dirt floor tents and uh one woman was was trying to eradicate circum uh, female circumcision and you know i mean it's like and, and doctors who are who are serving a completely underserved mm-hmm. pro, uh, population it's and selfless service right? yeah and and you know i'm like oh well, i i you know i won a couple of races you know right. you know you feel like you're not really necessarily the imposter syndrome were the, there was most time, assuredly like, yeah. and dick helped that because i i met I met I met His Holiness and and you feel drawn into his aura, I just bet, sort right. of the happiest person and on earth. And you think, well, I kind of want to stay here. You know, right. I kind of want to stay like right <laughs> here. Like, warm okay, embrace, right? There, there's somebody else behind me. I know, but but I kind of like it here. This is great. And and he's just he's fun and happy and engaging and funny and all this stuff. 
and and so when I received the award, he put the cath cow around my neck and sort of blessed me. And then I moved on and went to Dick. And Dick said to me, "Well, you realize you're just you're just starting on this journey." And I said, "Oh yeah, oh yeah." Acutely aware that I'm just starting <laughs> on this journey, but they had me come back the ne- the f- the next time five years later and speak to the award winners the night before. Oh, cool. And I shared that feeling of. I'm not worthy of being here. Yeah, I bet you they all felt the same way. And it was really funny because I had a few people come up to yeah. me at the elevator as I'm going going back to my room. And I said, I was ready to leave wow. beforehand. And and you you told me that, that it was okay, that I was here for the right reason, and that it is something that's going on in the future. So that's amazing cool. award from, from the Dalai Lama. It really is. Oh, that's really special. Yeah. Very cool. So I want to ask you back, you know, back to that moment you know, when your life changed, have you ever thought, you know, and I know this is just silly because it can't change history, but would you, if you could go back and change it, would you change it? I, you know, I get this, I guess, would you finish that run? And, uh, no, I really, the thing is, right. We have, we have no idea. You just don't know where our lives are going. Right. So with, with my foundation, our, Mo- our motto is it's not what happens to you it's what you do with what happens yeah. to you the the life is a life is a fluid thing it, it is. is it is happening and it's going in a direction and you as the individual think that you were in charge you're just paddling the river right you're just trying not to hit the banks or it really avoid is the rocks and, and you don't know and right. and so i wouldn't want to change the person that i am and the experiences that i've had right for that moment and 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 it's funny because like I was in New York last week and sometimes I go to New York and I feel like I feel like it's it's sort of the sliding doors kind of thing where, yeah. where I'm like I wonder I wonder if that would have been me right if if this hadn't happened or where I would have ended up and what I what I would have done but but back to the Dalai Lama he said that you know sometimes not getting what you want can be the greatest gift of all right sometimes we think we're way smarter than we actually are and mm-hmm. this is what I want and I'm I'm super happy with the direction that I've gone. Mm-hmm. So, in the early like the recovery phase, what gave you strength? You know, and what was the um, catalyst for you to like shift out of, you know, what was me? Why did this happen? I'm a victim here to like taking charge and realizing, you know, what I got, what I got, and I'm going to make something of this. So there were a few things. One, my family is incredibly strong. Nice. When the doctor told my parents and my brother what had happened, they cried. And when they were done, my father said, that's the last time we can cry. Hmm. They had to be wow. strong for, for me. They were, they were, they were supportive. And, mm-hmm. and so, so that was, that was, there was never a question. It was never, you know, it was never, well, why, why did you do this to me? You know, yeah. it was, it was, Hey, we're here to support you. you we're here to help you. Your fists at God. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, yeah. and so another thing was I was scared to death of what the possibilities might be, that this was not a time for me to stop. If I stopped, what I saw around me in the hospital might be my life moving forward. Oh, right. And which was just desperation and people who have given up. It really yeah. was. And so I needed to bring to bring my best. I needed to bring the most powerful part of me mm-hmm. to get out of because you're effectively you're in a hole, right? You're right. digging yourself yeah. out of this sort of metaphorical hole before you can too. even really start to move forward. So right. I realized that hey, life is I, I don't know what's going on. And I talked a little bit last night about the idea of realizing possible. Mm-hmm. And realizing possible to me is about winning the moment. Mm-hmm. And, and and it's not winning, you know, in a competition with somebody mm-hmm. else. It's it's winning that that sense of conviction within myself that mm-hmm. that I feel the, the conviction waning, that I feel myself drifting mm-hmm. and thinking I need my strength. I need to be able to win this moment. Mm-hmm. And the more the more you do that, you create a positive, a positive direction. Right. There's there's the athlete part of it, too. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's the denial of, well. This applies to other people, but they don't know who I am. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm going to do this and realistic or not, you know, you can say, okay, you're, you're, you're completely wrong in that. And it's like, okay, you, you probably are right. But, but it also, I knew, I knew what hard work was. Right. And and I knew, and I knew what good pain was. Right. Yeah. 
You know, yeah. this this is as a result of what I'm doing. This pain indicates that I'm getting better. There's healing and you know, it's movement the, forward. Yeah, yeah. yeah and being an athlete can can have a strong effect on the power to heal for sure. I, I think the it mindset really does. Right, and under like you said, understanding pain and that you know through pain we find growth and yeah. You know, and what do I need to do? And right, and a plan. What's the progression? With the plan, boom, boom, boom. Right? Okay, yeah, interesting. Yeah, so that was those were really the three things for me were the, the family, the sense of that that sense of, of winning the moment of, of realizing yeah. possible, but then also the athlete part of like okay, well this is what happened. What's my new training plan? Right. Yep. Yeah. You said something last night which really resonated with me because you know it's kind of near and dear to a lot of my teachings. You know, around um, training yourself to be like radically present and to be able to access more of your self more right. of your intuitive power your spiritual center flow and and also um your heart you know to be able to serve from that perspective and you said something like while you're lying in the hospital you know all your entire life as you knew it is over yeah but you realize that it was still you it was still you like the deeper real you like you you saw yourself your 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 true self as not being the person with or without the use of his legs it was someone different can you talk about that a little bit more because yeah. that's so profound for most people they never really connect to that deeper sense of self i i think that that's as we do competitions or whatever it is along the way we feel like we feel like we have the potential to lose ourselves. If I, yeah. if I lose now, then I'm then I've lost. Then I'm completely done. And I think that that for me, what I realized then was, well, like this is as bad as it can get. Right. And and you didn't lose that. And I'm still here. And, and so that thing that you worry about because because that's part of our protection as we enter as we enter some competition as we enter some conversation as we enter you know whatever it is I mean it's a job it's a it, it's it's an interview it's a whatever it is we feel like oftentimes we want to keep something in reserve mm -hmm. because if we lose then we've lost who we are. That's amazing. Yeah. And and to me it's like. You know, I, I, I got to that point and went, well, I mean, I've lost everything right now. Like, this is as close to death as I can possibly imagine being, but I'm still me. So it was that profound moment for me where I went, oh, okay, well, I, I, I'm not going to be intimidated again. I'm not going to let the situation make me smaller and make right. me lose effectively by not putting myself into it. Right. And have you been able to, or do you have a practice to keep that awareness alive in you every day? And when, even when it gets hard? That's that's the question. So so when I was in the hospital, the doctor didn't want to let me leave the hospital because I hadn't been depressed. <laughs> it really, I mean, he called me well, in. What into was his he thinking? That you just were in denial? Yeah, yeah, really that I was in denial. And then eventually <laughs> I'd figure it out. And then, you know, and then, then you know, I'm going to kill myself with drugs and alcohol and whatever, or whatever, you know, I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's the scenario that he's looking at. This guy figures out what happened to him. Then, then he's going to be a huge risk. Right. I went through the depression after I retired from competitive sport. Oh, no kidding. Sense of, yeah. Sense of identity, sense of like, right. well, who Which am was I? Which what, 15 years later? -ish? It was 15 years later, 15, more than 15 years later. So, so that was uh, 88 that we had the conversation with the doctor and then it was 2004 that I, so really 22 years later <laughs> that, and, yeah. and you think, well, you've proven that you can be the best in the world at what you do. So, right. so that should be a good thing. Right. But, but I suddenly became the guy in the wheelchair. That, that resume that I had, the, the things that I had won, that wasn't really who I was because it was a matter of where was I going next. And there's not necessarily a horizontal step from having been an athlete to whatever you're going to do next. I didn't, I didn't have, you know, I had, a, I had a fair number so of skills. Even, even having that awakening, you still tend to be, we, and I'm talking about us, right? really externally focused on some sort of goal to drive us, to motivate us. We need that. And oftentimes we can just forget that that's not us either. We wrap our identity around in that. We we do we do, yeah. and we need to 
we need a sense of purpose. I mean, somebody asked yeah. me about about you know, talking to people who've, who've recently had an injury and what would you what would you recommend recommend to them? And I'm like, find something find, you love, right? Find, find something that matters because that that I mean, it is your identity to a certain extent, but you you pour yourself into it. You put everything that you are mm-hmm. into that, and and in a lot of ways, I felt cheated because I finished, and and my my sense of importance fell off a cliff mm-hmm. I, I went from being really important within the community and and all this and pe- the phone's ringing and people want to talk to me and and then i fell off a cliff and i into like complete obscurity and and i had sacrificed and you know having been in the military right i mean a big part of your success is related to your sacrifices to get there right, right. And, and as an athlete it's a very similar kind of thing that mm-hmm. The, the sacrifices that I made were career sacrifices. I left Middlebury. All my friends went to create careers. I'm 36 when I retire. They've reached a point where where they have a career, where they're getting to be really important within within whatever business they're doing. And suddenly I have left my suspended adolescence <laughs> as an athlete because I, I was able to stay a child to a certain extent <laughs> as an athlete and then figuring out, okay, what do I do? And no uh, you know, what are, what are my skills? And I have some skills that other people might not necessarily have. I have some access to people that people might not have that, you know, you meet some of the leaders of some of the different companies and things like that just because you've been successful as an athlete, but I didn't know where I was going. So I, I sacrificed a career. I sacrificed relationships in a lot of ways that I was moving around the whole mm-hmm. time. And, and, and my job was, was the most important part of what I was doing and trying mm-hmm. to affect a big change throughout that job. So I didn't want to introduce somebody to my lifestyle. Right. You know, it's not really fair. I can, I, I've had girlfriends along the way, but it's, it's not fair to introduce somebody to my lifestyle. Why would, why would somebody want to do that? So, and, and the financial part of it, I made right. some money as an athlete, but I didn't make certainly nothing. The, yeah, yeah. Right. I can't retire right. on, on what I made. I, I was able to buy a house and those kinds of things. And, but, but I, making those sacrifices, I thought I've sacrificed so much of what people, what people generally consider to be important. Mm-hmm. And and what do I what do I you know what do I have in some ways and so mm-hmm. so I I actually cut myself off consciously in some ways from my greatest power from this sense of realizing possible the sense mm-hmm. of of being in that moment and win, mm-hmm. winning the moment and and in some ways like depression became became the companion interesting you go from doing whatever you're doing during the day and you come home and go into the office and you're like okay okay oh there it is now that's okay you had to let that you had to feel that you had there's probably 22 years yeah of feelings that you needed to let flow to flow through yeah cut off yourself off from yep i think that's that's a big part of it yeah and 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 it's funny because kilimanjaro was the thing that they got me reignited because you had another purpose I had another purpose and, and a lot of, I, I joined a group I had no desire to join, right? Nobody, nobody asked to become disabled. Right. You know, say, oh, I get parking spaces. This is awesome. You know, I was like, <laughs> I I the special pass, right? No. Yeah. No, I don't <laughs> want to be part of that group. I can get that. Yeah. I, like I that. It, it never, and, and I'm not saying that my life is, my, my life is, is fulfilling. The quality of my life is great, but, mm-hmm. but I didn't want to join that group. But at the same time, I, I, essentially became an advocate for that group because we're invisible in a lot of ways because from the time we're little we're taught not to stare at someone who looks different right and yeah no that was poignant sorry to interrupt but what you said last night was really interesting i mean one of my best friends is in a wheelchair and okay. um, he's broke his neck twice oh i mean he recovered and walked after the first one when he was in 20 he was an athlete and that helped and then it happened again when he was like 52 or something wow and he hasn't been able to get up out of the chair since right and um and I see him every day because he's running our foundation, which we work with veterans who are suffering from post-medic stress and are suicidal. And they're also didn't ask to join that club. No, not at all. You know what I mean? They're right. The, they're at an inflection point too. Right. Because, you know, 20, and it's not as visible in some ways, which makes and, it more and difficult. And they feel invisible too. Yeah, they feel invisible, but then it's also like, you know, a wheelchair is visible. Yeah. Where the PTSD is like, you look like a normal person, right? Right. So it's different. In one case, they don't see themselves and they won't look at themselves. And in your case, most people won't see you because they're taught, they don't know how to deal with it. 
you know, know how to open the conversation. This, um, I'll have to tell this one thing because it's really interesting. We, I run a company called Seal Fit, and so I have Seal coaches who try to help people wake up and transform and find their, you know, find a deeper part of themselves. And we did an event with a bunch of disabled, um, both veterans and athletes, and um, and we paired them. Up. It was a 12-hour nonstop kind of Navy SEAL-style training event. We paired them up with executives from YPO. Okay. And they were swim buddies. Uh-huh. It was the most profound experience for everybody, even even us as coaches. But one of the things that the um, the disabled athletes and warriors loved w- was that we, you know, we don't look at them any differently than any other athlete or any other warrior, Right you're missing a leg okay fine we'll work around that and we just have to modify things or you know you can't walk we'll work around that you'll work around that but i'm not going to treat you any different this is your challenge you in fact in a lot of cases you have to help the ceo and that's what happened all these all these warriors and and yeah. athletes were helping these ceos get through this event right. yeah because they were the strong ones it was it was just so profound and we were we were just like it was one of the most humbling experiences Ever. It, it's interesting. So I am I am in the midst. I've shot a pilot for a TV show that I want to create and want to host called I Wish I Could. Oh, that's and cool. And what we're doing is we're flipping perception of disability upside down when an expert with a disability teaches two people off the street yeah. an adventure. How to do something or something new, adventure. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, because yeah. I mean the assumption is, oh, well, I've got to help you out. And it's like, no, I'm the expert here. Right, I don't I'm need not, your help. <laughs> I'm, the, I'm the one teaching you, and you're like, "Oh, this is a little scary." Like, it's like, "Yeah, you'll be, you'll be fine." Here, let me talk you through what what's going on, and and I think that that's that's the part of it that that we as human beings oftentimes, you know, we have we have a bit of a, a Superman fetish in some ways of like, okay, right. well, those are the people like the Superman that like that's that's somebody who can teach me something, but right. our eyes aren't really open to well, this is somebody who's passionate about about something, and and one. You can teach me to be passionate in some ways, you right, know, like I can, right. I can see the passion and go, oh, that's something that's really important. But two, most people know something about something. There's always something to learn absolutely. from somebody else. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. That's very cool. So um, you retired from sports and how did you, you know, you mentioned Kilimanjaro. So that was like something to kind of like snap you out of your reverie and get you focused on something. And then how did that lead to, you know, your current trajectory as a speaker and helping other people kind of realize what's possible? I think that there's a there's a big part of so one Kilimanjaro, the appealing part about Kilimanjaro is that we're we're all climbing our mountain, right? No yeah. matter who we are, metaphorically, the metaphorical powerful, mountain. Yeah. We're we're all Sisyphus, right? We're pushing the yeah. pushing the boulder so up. You the actually, mountain. technically speaking, you took a bike up that you hand pedaled yeah so it's a hand cycle bike it's kind of like it's kind of looks like a mars rover married to arm pedal power so four <laughs> wheels did it have big bulky wheels to get over the rocks and stuff it like had that? so we actually used uh wheels that are used for riding bikes on the on the snow oh right so they're four inches wide uh you know, and and we were running two to three pounds of pressure so the the tire would really literally just envelop Grab rocks it. it didn't have we didn't have much of a knobby on it at all Jimmy, and, and just just pedaling and what a grind how long did that take it took six and a half days up and it took a day and a half down and i was flying <laughs> at two and a half miles an hour like on that's when down. i that's yeah. when i no on the way up oh, on the, on way, the up. way up that's when i was maxing i think that on the way down i probably i probably hit 20 to 30 miles, miles an hour is actually a good clip considering most people walk about maybe four miles an hour you know yeah so so the first the first 2,000 feet I did in under an hour, which is really trekking pace. Yeah, you know people do a thousand thousand yeah. feet an hour kind of thing, and so so that was that 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 to me was cool, but that was also on effectively like a road, so it made it right. relatively easy. It was a right. dirt road, but then then it, as it got more technical and technical for me, is stuff that you step over. Right. Yeah, the I'm, ride over. Yeah, you know, I'm like, okay, I've got to figure out how to. Eat. All these things are just. Do you had a support team? I imagine we had. I had eight people on my team. We did. We did a film on it, a documentary okay. film. So the, uh, so uh, so we had two camera, two camera people, a sound slash everything. I mean, the guy who's responsible for the diesel powered generator. I had my mm-hmm. director, had my guide. We had a doctor who had ski raced with me in college. And we had the guy who's the, the chair of my board. So those were our eight team. And then we had 69 porters 
each camera person, I think, had five or six porters carrying gear. We had somebody who just carried my everyday wheelchair. We had the people carrying the food, the mm. the chefs, you know, everything. Wow. Yeah. So it was it was it's it was a, a movie production. circus. <laughs> I have to tell you, it's in my, popping in my head right now, but um, I uh, one of my friends is a guy named Kyle Maynard. And yep. he, he was born with no arms and legs, and right. he climbed Kilimanjaro. He did, He yeah. literally bear crawled up the whole freaking mountain. Yeah. And I, you know, I can think, I'm trying to think of you trying to take this bike over, and I'm thinking of him bear crawling up the mountain. I'm like, people have no excuses whatsoever. <laughs> you know what I mean? If you got all arms and legs, you got nothing, you know, no excuses. That was one of the funniest things, because there are, what, I think it's 25,000 people a year attempt to climb it right and it's about a 50 percent success Is rate right? okay. and and it's euphoria when you make it to the top and so right. you know as you're going up somebody's invariably coming down coming down that same trail and you'd hear people oh that was the hardest thing i've ever done and then they'd see me and go suddenly really quiet like, hmm. <laughs> that's awesome so it was pretty funny right. but what kilimanjaro did for me is it allowed me to to have the platform in a lot of ways i lost when i retired right and a platform to 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 help not tell us hundreds of millions of people example. right who are who are invisible you know to to be able to say to hopefully to change the to change the questioning or change the narrative from that's too bad to well what do you do Right. And to see the individual as opposed to seeing the disability. And so it, it got me it got me going. It gave me a purpose. It gave me that platform again. And that's that's really what Kilimanjaro did and moving moving forward from that. In some ways it's it's a matter of, of embracing what I do next and developing my voice and realizing that I'm a storyteller. Right. That ultimately is what I do. Right. And that that a lot of what I'm trying to do is get people to look beyond that stereo, that, that the, the wheelchair or to, to look beyond, you know, there, but for the grace of God, go I, and I'm like, no, no, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm you. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of ways, I'm the you that you hope to be. Mm -hmm. You just haven't been in the yeah. situation right. where you've had to prove it right. to yourself. And this is, this is the human existence. I mean, I, right. I do it, I approach it in a little bit different way. Right. But that's where, and, and, and you have to find different avenues to be able to say it. So with my foundation, we do a school program called Name Tags. Okay. Looks at the labels that we put on ourselves and others, which are often our limitations. Mm -hmm. I can't do this because I'm too, mm -hmm. too old, I'm too tired, I'm too fat, I'm too poor, mm -hmm. I'm too busy, whatever it is. I mean, it's so right. easy to have those excuses. Mm -hmm. And so it's one part resilience with the motto of it's not what happens to you, it's what you do with what happens mm -hmm. to you. But it also encourages the kids to, to steer out of the mainstream to figure out what matters to them, what yeah. their passion how might be. How are they be. unique and how yeah. can they show up? Yeah, yeah because That's otherwise cool. you finish and you go, well, you can do whatever you want to do. And you're like, I don't know what I want to do. I've just been following the crowd. I guess I'll just mm -hmm. do what everybody else does. Mm -hmm. And so doing that, that's where the television show comes in. Uh, I'm, I'm working potentially on another one, hosting another one called Inclusion at Work. Nice. Uh, finishing the, the illustrations. I've learned how to draw oh, cool. relatively uh, <laughs> for for the uh, children's book, for my second children's book on the climb. Right. Uh, working on my memoir, uh, doing a lot of speaking, you know, yeah. corporate speaking and stuff like that. And trying to trying to trying to essentially create a community. The kids, their minds are open. They're like, all right. I, I get it. Yeah. I'm moving forward. We as adults are a little bit more jaded, mm -hmm. but part of part of the speaking to corporate groups is the opportunity to connect with those corporations mm -hmm. that have a much bigger megaphone and right. can affect the change. Can affect the change. How do you, you know, you mentioned hundreds of millions of disabled individuals and largely they feel invisible. And I work with vets right. who feel invisible and our biggest challenge is actually finding the vets because they're like they re recluse themselves yeah do you find that with disabled at least like maybe newly disabled they're they're just desperate and then they recluse themselves how do we reach them to inspire them i mean it's well, uh, i get like i do corporate speaking and training and it's sure. great to inspire someone who wants to go from great to greater right sure but how do we reach the people who really need the that people in, in desperation yeah. and i think that that's I think that's a that's a part of it, and and that's where I think we have to have those venues, and and that's where television is great because it's in the comfort of your own home. Right. You're sitting on your couch. You're not having somebody say, "Hey, Mark, this is what you need to do." And you're right. like, 
well, let me go think about that right. for a little bit. I'm not going to give you an answer right now, yeah. but this is where you can kind of process. And, and that's, that's where I think it could be helpful. And, and I realized that, that part of, part of what I do is, is, is representing sort of the, the, you know, 1% or whatever it is of people. And that was what, that was my biggest, biggest takeaway from Kilimanjaro is that there was a part where they had to carry me for about a hundred feet of vertical. But what that did, it was the greatest gift. And I didn't realize it in the moment. In the moment, it was failure. Yeah, because you wanted to go unassisted. Unassisted. I wanted to break the record. And that was the the story you wanted to tell. And as if like 100 feet is going to change that story, people's perception of your, you know, accomplishment. Right. But for me, (laughs) it did. And and the thing is that, that I became this superhero kind of figure. And as an athlete, even even just leaving college, I left I left the hospital and went back to college. And all my friends said, I could never do what you've done. Yeah. And I'm like, this is step number one. Right. This is it. This is just coming back. But then you win some races and, and things like that. And you're perpetuating this image. And it's it it's it's that is in a lot of ways the most debilitating thing mm-hmm. that you're not a real human. Mm-hmm. You are a two dimensional figure super in a lot of ways this yeah, superhero than everyone else image and and i think that that's that's the part of of what we you know the story that we need to tell is that no matter who you are you're you're fallible and you're gonna need help you're it takes a help, team man. and you're yeah, gonna fail I'm glad, yeah i'm sure it makes a lot of sense i'm going up and giving the impression that you did this whole thing alone leaves the team out you couldn't possibly have done that alone even not, even from the beginning not including that hundred yards right. or hundred feet yeah no, yeah. no way. No, couldn't have done it, takes it alone. Takes a team to do anything important yeah. or valuable in life, doesn't it? Yeah, I was delusional, <laughs> but that's you know, but that's that's the way it works, you know. And that's the way we're all delusional at some level. Oh yeah, and I probably I'm sure I'm still delusional, <laughs> but but yeah, that's 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 the way it works. Is realizing that that team is really the the foundation of of my power and 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 empowering other people. Right. Oftentimes, I, I think that's something that we don't learn that I didn't learn as I, as I was growing up, you know, you, right. you try to little league or whatever, you're trying to win the game. And, and it's like, well, how can, how can you help prop that other person up? How can you do that? Because the team is going to be better. Right. I love that. So if you're listening and you know, someone who's disabled, let them know that they have a teammate and a coach yeah. and Chris Waddell. And, and if you're a vet, I'll be your teammate and your coach. Fair enough. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And, uh, don't try to do it alone. That's for sure. Don't no, no, alone. we can't because our minds are dark places yeah, when we get to that point too. Right. right? It's, yeah, it's yeah, hard. You just cannibalize yourself, eat yourself alive. Wow. I wish we had more time, Chris. This yes. has been really neat. I really hope we get to see each other again in the future. Our prize will cross. Definitely. Thanks yeah. for doing what we do. Likewise. Keep it up. Yeah, you too. And, uh, what was we saying? The seals. Hoo ya. Hoo ya. All right. Yeah, get a big hoo ya. Where can people find out more about the documentary, about the work you're doing and whatnot? So a couple of different websites. We have the One Revolution website is one-revolution.org. So okay. that's my nonprofit. Got it. You can check it out. If, if you want to book a school presentation for your kids, <clears throat> oh, cool. come to that. The uh, my my for profit because it's I have the nonprofit world mm-hmm. and the for profit world. For profit is is my speaking, writing, and television. That is Chris Waddell speaking. So it's C H R I S W A D D E L L speaking dot com. Dot com okay. That has that, that has I'm, I'm I will get back to it of, of publishing my memoir serially, Sweet. a chapter a week kind oh, of thing. Cool. Yeah, um, and you online. can buy my books there and idea. stuff like yeah. that. Right. It's fun. It's it's a little daunting. Yeah. Or every other week actually. You got to you got to discipline yourself to do that writing. Yeah, it, it is. Hard Writing's work, a hard one. That blank yeah. page is I'm daunting. I'm getting ready to uh, restart my blog, and my intention is to do a daily post. Yep. Three to five hundred words. Yeah, and that's going to take some. That's discipline. a lot. Yeah, that's a. I had somebody who, who at one point, who was a writer, who said that she gives herself a half an hour. Yeah, whatever to do a she blog. gets done. Yeah, this is it. Done. Do it because you can. You can take all day. Yeah. to do that. And three hundred to five hundred words is a lot of. Yeah, I might end up being a little less sometimes, but so I'm giving myself some. Well, people want to Gumby flexibility. There you go. <laughs> this is one of my mottos. So. <laughs> exactly. And and the other place they can find me is is on Instagram is Chris Waddell or Chris underscore Waddell underscore living underscore it. Okay. So Chris Waddell living it with underscores in between. We'll everything. put those on in the show notes. 
Yeah, cool. that'd be awesome. Definitely. Awesome. Yeah, and we'll give you a shout out. And we'll let you know when this thing is going to go live. And and um, yeah, who yeah. Good luck with everything. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. I yeah. really appreciate what you're doing. Likewise. All right, folks. Thanks for listening. This has been the Unbeal Mind podcast. Go check out Chris Vidal's work and um, let's help him help others who are in those moments of desperation or you know just could really use a little motivation to get on their path to healing and finding their greatness in spite of their disability. Yeah, yeah? in spite of their situation. In spite That's of their situation, right? Yeah. I don't even like the word disability, right? No. It's, it's kind of a negative No, we're thing. all in a situation we're that all we, have, in we have to get out of, right? We got our shit. We call them a shit duration. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> all right, everybody. See you next time. Divine out. Hoo-yah. Hey, this is Mark Devine. Thanks very much for watching the Unbeatable Mind podcast on YouTube. You can also find the podcast at iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, and unbeatablemind.com slash podcast. Be sure to check out the new episode released every week. Hoo-yah.